Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate this wonderful turnout. It's great to see so many faces of important business leaders here and members of our community. We appreciate the wonderful turnout, especially since it's such a busy time of year. And we also extend and keep in our hearts the many other folks who said they would love to be here, and they're here in spirit, but they just couldn't be here on this particular day. We're very pleased to have Governor Lynch here to meet and talk with us. And before he starts his official address, the Greater Keene Business Community, we have another special event to include. This wasn't publicized through the media, but there is a very special award to be given today to commemorate a community initiative that has been in progress for many months. Would you all please join me in welcoming Angela Shepard, MD, the Trauma Coordinator of New Hampshire Division of Fire Standards and Training and Emergency Medical Services. Angela? for um, having us here and letting us uh, participate in, in the luncheon. Um, as I said, I am part of the Bureau of EMS here for um, the state of New Hampshire. And as part of my job, I work with, um, collaborate with the Division of Public Health, Department of Health and Human Services, and also work with the American Heart Association um, to award the Heart Safe Communities Program. I'm going to talk to Nancy Pedersini from um, the Heart Association to tell you a little bit more about the specifics. <laughs> Sorry, I hate microphones and public speaking. <laughs> but one of the reasons why I'm so um, happy to be a part of this is because it really embodies um, the best of what I think we see in the venture communities. The idea of collaboration and cooperation. Um, that through the uh, Heart Safe Communities Program, you're strengthening what's called the chain of survival. And by implementing this chain of survival, um, the national survival rate is generally 6%. But with communities that have implemented these, this program, it rises to 20%. Um, so I appreciate the effort of these two communities that we're going to be honoring today. And I'm going to have um, Nancy tell you a little bit about the specific program that they have implemented. Thank you, Angela. Um, I'm Nancy Petterzini with the American Heart Association in New Hampshire. And I'm very pleased to be here today to be part of um, this uh, designation ceremony for um, a couple of communities, um, for heart safe um, communities. And um, just to, as, um, as was just referenced, to let you know a little bit about what heart safe communities is, um, it's basically it encourages individuals and residents of the community to recognize the signs and symptoms of cardiac arrest, to learn um, CPR, and to know when to call 911. Um, along with um, the use of automated external <coughs> defibrillators by whoever the, the first bystander is who comes on the scene. Um, Heart Safe Communities um, is a, um, a process more than it is an initiative where um, a community comes together and collaborates on where automated external defibrillators should be placed in the community. Um, not only with first responders such as fire departments and police, but also locations within the community. Um, that advanced cardiac life support be dispatched um, appropriately um, when this happens. And also, and probably most importantly, to develop an ongoing process to evaluate that chain of survival and things that could be done in an ongoing um, manner to, uh, to tweak that a bit. If anyone is interested in learning more about New Hampshire Heart Safe Communities, um, you can go on to the um, Department of Safety's website and this um, document um, uh, is, is right on there and um, hopefully we'll get more communities in New Hampshire also um, to become Heart Safe. Um, and at this point, I would like to um, turn this over to um, Governor John Lynch, um, who will help us um, with uh, presenting um, a couple of uh, signs to go to these communities. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Right, so this is a photo opportunity for you. Um, so um, to receive the award for Keen is Amy Matthews of um, Cheshire Medical Center. So, although I am the person standing here, it is only through the effort of everyone at our hospital, within our community, within our pre-hospital community, our colleges, our public schools, who all came together to say yes. We are ready, ready to make Keene a safer place for everyone. So we actually accept this on behalf of many, many people throughout our community. Thank you. And now to receive the award um, on behalf of um, Swansea is the fire chief. Norm Scancy, fire chief from Swansea. Um, these two towns and help to see uh, more communities participating in this program. Again, um, check the website and it has the application and any information that has um, my business card if any folks want to contact me. But thank you very much. Thank you, Angela, and all of the Cheshire Medical and Swansea and Team Community who made that award possible. That's a nice distinction for our community to have. So now we will get to our main event. This kind of event is what American democracy is all about. We are here to participate in our government and be good informed citizens. Without participation, democracy doesn't work. And showing up is what makes it happen. Thank you all again for being a part of this country, our state, in our community and what makes it work. We have about 140, 145 people here today, and these are the folks who make our community work. There are many people here who, would, who deserve to be recognized, some of whom you know, some of whom you may not know, and I would like to list them off quickly and ask them to just uh, stop eating for a moment and stand remain standing and we'll applaud them all at the end for their contributions to the community and many of them are chamber member uh, participants as well. First, we could not forget to thank our sponsor. Our financial sponsor is PSNH. Our media sponsor is King Sentinel. PSNH today is re represented by several PSNH people, but Primarily Bonnie Carrillo and Susan Blossenberg. Stand up, please. It won't take long, I promise. <laughs> the Sentinel is represented today by Jim Rumineer and Bob Lyle. Would you guys stand up? We're going to have Matt for Jim staying in the Sentinel. Now we have State Senator Molly Kelly. Molly. <laughs> Team Mayor Dale Friedrich. Kendall Lane. I'm going to ask you to hold your applause for the rest until the end. We now have Lynn Rust, our chairman of the board from Lynn Rust CPA, Theo Bassett of People's United Bank, Steve Bianco from Savings Bank of Walpole, Art Nichols, Cheshire Medical Center, Malcolm Katz, architect, Sarah Paseo of McMillan Construction, Marianne LaCroix Lindbergh of King State College, Denise Meadows of In and Out Hospitality, Bob Cox, Manadnock Radio Group, Bob Lyle, whom I mentioned before, of King Central, and Bonnie Carrillo, I mentioned before, Public Service. Those are board members. Don't clap, don't clap yet. <laughs> Other folks who made and continue to make significant ongoing contributions to the chamber, either on committees or related projects. Jim Narkowitz of the Nevada Valley Council and David Inn. Jim Rose from Engelberg Construction. 
Larry Portello, budget blinds of Keen, Bruce Sterling and John Hayes of the Let It Shine Committee and Pumpkin Festival. Ed Thomas, photography, our official chamber photographer. He's, he's here, he's camera, but there won't be any pictures of him probably. Same with Bill Reeve of Eastern Video. He is our official videographer. So thank you all. And if there's someone at your table, you know, oh, and Connor, I know that I had you on the list. I must have skipped over your name. Someone else at your table, please have them stand up as well. Thank you very much for your contribution. And now I know Governor Roman Chesson had a chance to eat. I think he ate on the way over here. <laughs> he never gets it. John H. Lynch was born on November 25th, 1962. He's the 80th and current governor of New Hampshire. Lynch was first elected in 2004 and has been re-elected every two years since. In September, Lynch announced he would not seek a fifth uh, two-year term in 2012, which makes us that much more grateful that he's here today because we know he's not here campaigning. <laughs> From 2005 in December to the most recent polls in 2010, Lynch has been ranked among the most popular of all Democratic incumbents. And we're very grateful that he's here today. Without further ado, I'd like to ask you to please join me in welcoming the Honorable Governor John H. Lynch. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for the very warm welcome um, when I came in. Um, I have to come here more often. And I should also say thank you for getting me out of the state house. <laughs> Sorry, Molly. <laughs> um, so I'm delighted to be here. I love coming to Keene. I love coming to Cheshire County. Um, as I was talking with Kendall earlier, you come here to Keene and Cheshire County and you're tucked over in this part of New Hampshire and it's very clear to me that you all have your act together. You are confident in who you are. You're confident in how you make your own decisions. And it's very evident. And I noticed that when I was chair of the board of trustees of the university system coming over here to meet at Keene State College, I'd say the same thing about Keene as I do about the city of Keene and Cheshire County. I want to thank Dale for all the great work that um, Dale has done as mayor. <laughs> Dale and I first campaigned together back in 2004. Um, Dale and I were at the Cheshire County Fair, and I remember so well, Dale, I remember exactly where we were standing. Um, we were talking to this man, probably for 40 minutes. Here I am campaigning for governor of the state of New Hampshire. And so after 40 minutes, um, I said, so, what part of New Hampshire are you from? And he says, I'm not from New Hampshire, <laughs> I'm from Massachusetts. So we learned pretty quickly after that to uh, screen them before we went and spent 40 minutes with them. And Kendall, I want to um, congratulate you and look forward to working very closely with you. I really believe um, that it's a partnership between the state and the city, the mayor, the governor, uh, state senators. We're all working together to serve the people in the We all serve the same people. So very much look forward to working with you. And Senator Molly Kelly, it's great to see you. Uh, Molly um, does a wonderful job representing you all and representing the state. So thanks for all your years of service, Molly. I thought I'd talk a little bit about what's going on in the state and then open it up to any questions or comments or feedback or criticisms that you may have. Um, I have developed a very thick skin working with the legislature, particularly during this last year. Um, the National Journal, uh, last December, had a wonderful article. Um, it was December 4th, and it was an article about New Hampshire. And it was basically a message to prospective presidential candidates coming to our great state. Now, as you know, we have a lot of presidential candidates running around. We don't have anybody here today running for president, do we, Dale? No? Dale, you're not running. Um, so anyway, 
The message, again, it was December 4th of last year in the National Journal, and it was a message to prospective presidential candidates. And the message was, when you go to New Hampshire, instead of you going to New Hampshire and telling people in New Hampshire how you think it should work, go to New Hampshire and learn how it works well. And then take from the people of New Hampshire the lessons that you should then apply to your own state or apply to the country. It then went on to describe New Hampshire as the highest performing state economy in the country. The Federal Reserve said New Hampshire had the fastest growth of any state last year and is expected to have the fastest growth of any state this year. So it went on and on and on and extolled the virtues of New Hampshire. Um, as you know, within the last six months, New Hampshire has again been recognized or acknowledged as the most livable state in the country. In the last six months, New Hampshire has been recognized as the safest state in the nation. In the last six months, New Hampshire has been recognized as the best state in the country in which to raise children, which I think is really special. 50 states, New Hampshire is the best place to raise children. Um, we have an unemployment rate that's 40% below the national average. And that said, which I think is very, very good, there are only three states which have a lower unemployment rate than New Hampshire. And quite frankly, they don't count. <laughs> That's off the record. <laughs> um, but that said, we still have over 30,000 people who are unemployed. And I think we all need to do everything we can to get people back to work. And I really believe that everybody who wants a job should have the opportunity to get a job here in New Hampshire. We were recently ranked um, one of the healthiest states in the nation, the best educated state. Um, we are consistently ranked as one of the wealthiest states in the nation. So what does all this mean? To me, it means that we have a strategy that's working. Whether it's a strategy that was developed consciously or inadvertently, we have a strategy that's working. And I think we need to be very careful that we remain protective of the strategy. It doesn't mean we don't try to move New Hampshire forward, which we should do, but it does mean we should embrace the strategy that we have and not mess it up. And I continue to have the dis that discussion with people at the State House about how New Hampshire is doing well relative to other states. Um, but again, it means that we should try to move New Hampshire forward and protect all that's so special about our great state. So how are we moving New Hampshire forward? Well, one of the ways is focusing on reducing the high school drop-off rate, um, which I think is important for a whole bunch of reasons. In fact, I think it's really defining for New Hampshire as a state. Um, at a time when high high school drop-off rates are of epidemic proportions in other states, which is what they are. I go to these National Governor Association meetings and talk with other governors, and I'd say to other governors, what do you worry about when you wake up at 3 in the morning? One of the things they tell me consistently is they worry about the high high school dropout rates in their own states. And we're talking about dropout rates that are in some cases not only double digits, but higher than 20%. So at a time when high school dropout rates are literally of epidemic proportions in other states, in New Hampshire, we have reduced our high school dropout rate to a remarkably low 0.97%. Isn't that terrific? 0.97%. And we have a goal of reducing our high school dropout rate to zero. Here in Keene, um, you all have reduced your dropout rate and cut your dropout rate in half in the last couple of years. Um, and now it's a little bit higher, but not much higher than the state average. So what does all that mean? Well, one, it's giving our students the opportunity to graduate, our students the opportunity to get a good job, to go on to higher education if that's what they choose to do, and ultimately to have better lives. It used to be that kids could drop out here in New Hampshire at age 16, and as you know, we raised the compulsory attendance age. It used to be kids could drop out at age 16, which um, was the result of a law passed in 1903. And back then, kids could drop out of school and get jobs working uh, on farms, uh, in the mills, and Hampshire was primarily an agrarian community. So the assumption on which that law was based is now no longer valid. The kids who drop out can't get jobs. Even the military will not accept high school dropouts. 
And obviously the social costs are high. Rates of teen pregnancy, alcohol and drug abuse are much higher among the dropout population. 80% of the prisoners in this country are high school dropouts. So we want to give our students the opportunity to get jobs, as I said, and have better lives. It's also important for economic development. I continue to travel around New Hampshire and meet with business people. I meet with business people all the time. And they continue to tell me that they still need workers. They need workers with the skills and talents and qualifications necessary to fill the jobs that they have in order to drive revenues, make more money, reinvest it in the company, and hire more people. So not only are we creating opportunities for our students, but we're helping with economic development by getting students ready to be employees to fill the jobs that companies have. And that helps with economic development. I think we need to continue to be protective of the wonderful system of public higher education we have here in New Hampshire. I was very distraught with, with the budget that was proposed in terms of, and, and that ended up becoming law with its cut to, cut to public higher education. Um, I think our system of public higher education is something that we need to be very protective of here in New Hampshire. It's a wonderful system. We have Keene State College, we have the community colleges, and they do a wonderful job. And we do know from research that education drives jobs. So the more we get our kids educated, the more jobs will be available, and more companies will end up locating in New Hampshire. I know as a former CEO, the first question I would ask when we were considering where to locate a plant or an office, would be are the workers available? Because everything else could work, but if the workers aren't available to fill the jobs, companies aren't going to locate there and they're not going to expand it. So this is what I mean about moving New Hampshire forward but protecting what we have in terms of our strategy. Another area that we have focused on is moving New Hampshire toward greater use of renewable energy. I know this is a subject matter that you all care a lot about in the Keene area. Um, renewable energy, biomass, is perfect for New Hampshire. We have an abundance of biomass. It's environmentally friendly. It will create jobs and over time, it will stabilize our energy costs because we're diversifying our sources. And we've made a lot of progress um, developing renewable energy here in New Hampshire. And we are moving forward with a $275 million, 70 megawatt biomass plant in Berlin. And that not only helps the economy in Berlin, but it continues to push us along the path toward renewable energy. So again, it's moving New Hampshire forward, but still protecting the good things that we have here in our great state. I think we need to continue to maintain our infrastructure. And Kendall and I were talking about this um, a little bit earlier. You know, the infrastructure is so important for economic development. Um, and by infrastructure, I'm talking not only roads and bridges that we really need to maintain, but also broadband capability. And I think we should continue to explore the opportunity for rail here in New Hampshire. So the whole infrastructure, um, I think that is absolutely critical because we could save money in the short term, I'm sure, just by not spending it, but it'll cost us over the long term if we start having roads and bridges which are not kept in good repair. Um, I've seen that around New Hampshire, that short-term decisions sacrifice long-term economic development. So we need to keep that up as well. And then I think we need to continue to make progress with respect to health care. Um, as I talk with business people again and I say, what do you worry about? They talk to me about the high cost of health care here in New Hampshire. That as health care costs for themselves and their businesses continue continues to increase, they're forced into a position of reducing coverage for their employees, in some cases eliminating coverage for their employees, which they do not want to do. Healthcare costs go up, it depresses margins, they then can't, they then can't hire more people based on the profitability that has been diminished as a result of the high cost of healthcare. We are doing some things. Um, we are trying to move away from focusing on fee-for-service and focusing on incentives that promote greater utilization and going to a more managed care model type of service. Cheshire Medical Center has been very, very instrumental in leading the way with regard to the pilot program that you're doing there at Cheshire Medical Center um, in a way to get us away from, uh, as I said, just fee for service which drives up costs. Our healthcare costs in New Hampshire, by the way, are very high. We are one of the healthiest populations in New Hampshire, but our healthcare costs are also very high. 
Right now, they're about 18.5% of gross state product. And if we can't stem those costs, they'll eventually go up to 22% of gross state product. And that will squeeze out investments in other areas, like education, like infrastructure, like economic development. So as I said, I think we need to continue. We've made some progress. We need to continue to make more progress with regard to um, our health care costs. Um, in terms of what's going on with the state budget, I have lots of concerns about the state budget. Um, that is now law. Concerns about the cuts to the hospitals and Cheshire Medical um, ended up being cut in terms of dish payments that they um, regularly and annually expected. I had concerns with the cuts to, as I already mentioned, public higher education. Um, that said, I think the state budget is in relatively good shape. We had a $26 million surplus last fiscal year. Um, and if you take out all the Medicaid enhancement tax issues, which we're dealing with separately, um, our state is, in terms of the budget, is ahead of where we plan to be and ahead of last year, with one other major exception, the legislature, and this uh, present company not included, um, in its wisdom decided to cut the cigarette tax, um, saying that we would end up um, selling more cigarettes if we cut the tax by 10 cents, and that's cost us $11 million so far this year versus last year. Um, so their theory in terms of what would work did not prove out to be the case. Um, all this said, um, New Hampshire continues to be a very special place. I think New Hampshire is the greatest state and the greatest country in the world, and I think about this every day as governor. Every day I think about it. What a wonderful state we have. And you certainly have a wonderful community here in Keene and in the Cheshire County area. I also think, and I'll just close with this, I think that, and I've said this before, that New Hampshire really does work best when New Hampshire works together. When people are fighting with each other and squabbling with each other, which is what we see happen all the time in Washington, things end up breaking down. And when people do work together, we can accomplish amazing things. You know, I remember so well, as many of you do, the floods that occurred, the so-called Alstead floods, which occurred in 2005. And what I saw then was New Hampshire really working together. All the branches of state government, the elected officials, working very closely with the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, the DNA, the hospitals, working closely with the local responders, the police chief, the firefighters, uh, DPW at the local level, and everybody working together to help those in need. And when that happens, New Hampshire can do amazing things. And when it doesn't happen, you can't focus on solving problems and creating more opportunities for the people of our great state. Um, as Dale reminded me, I am, I guess we're both lame ducks now, right Dale? Um, although my tenure is going to go a little bit longer than yours. But um, I have very much enjoyed being governor. It's the best job in the world. And I will continue to do everything I can over the next 12 months to keep New Hampshire the special state that it is. So thank you very much for inviting me here today. Thank you. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions, comments, um, hear any criticisms. You want to say anything about Dale? Go ahead and do that. <laughs> yes. Um, the question is, what is the future of the dish payments? Um, my hope, and then I can talk about what I expect, my, my hope is that this is a one-time hit to the hospitals and that eventually um, the dish payments will be restored, um, much like the way they were managed in previous years. That's my hope. Um, talking with some legislators, particularly those in the state senate, I think it's their hope as well. Um, ultimately, it's a decision that the legislature needs to make in terms of the budget. But um, I think it, is, it was also our hope that they could, they could be restored. wouldn't happen in this fiscal year, but they could be restored in the next fiscal year if the money is available. Um, so I would like to see that happen. But again, ultimately, it will be the, in part the legislature's decision. But it's just a down effect. Even aside from the hardship it places on hospitals, 
Oh, I know. I, I know it. I mean, to, to think that the need goes away because you cut the budget, whether we're talking about dish payments or we're talking about other cuts in health and human services, is naive because it doesn't happen. All that happens is the need goes someplace else and those costs get downshifted to the local communities. No, I, I understand completely, and I agree. And I think it's naive to think it doesn't work otherwise. I think Cheshire was cut by, I think it was $6 million in terms of your expected dish payments. And it was not only the cuts, it was the way it was done. I mean, there was no opportunity to have a collaborative discussion as to how to address the problem together. It was just thrust out there and imposed on the hospitals. And we're talking about cuts of, to the biennium of $300 million. So these are not insignificant cuts. Um, and again, there was no opportunity for, for Art and his colleagues to have a discussion as to what's the problem and how can we work on it together. So it's very, very difficult. And I agree with you. I understand. Yes? Governor, I've seen information from Dennis Delay where um, we're a great state. We're losing our youth. How can we use the fact that we're the most livable, um, the best place to raise children, low crime rate, to, to reverse that trend? Everybody, is everybody hearing these questions? No. No. Um, well, do you want to stand up and restate it so everybody can hear? There's information we know that we're becoming a brain state. We're losing our youth um, um, over the last 10 years outside of our state. So how can we use the fact that we're the most livable state, um, lowest crime rate, and, and the best place to raise children to reverse that trend? Um, two ways. One is we have what is called a stay work play initiative where we have basically young professionals um, charged with in part the responsibility of getting their colleagues excited about staying in New Hampshire. There's a very active website in place where the young people can, can uh, um, network with each other and focus on those things that are, that are um, important and helpful to young people. So again, it's driven by young professionals and I think that's been very, very helpful. Ultimately, I believe that the way to keep young people here in New Hampshire is education. Because education drives jobs. And if we can keep our young people educated, if we can encourage them to go on to higher education, if that's what they choose to do, the companies will come here and expand here and locate here, and the jobs will be created and the young people will stay here. I think it's the absolute best thing that we can do. A professor at UNH, Ross Cattell, did all kinds of statistical analysis to see what drives jobs. And the only positive correlation, and this isn't really a big surprise, is that education drives jobs. So we need to have a vibrant um, King State College. We need to have a vibrant community college system. We need to have um, a vibrant system of public education here in New Hampshire. And that will help keep people here in our state. One of the, one of the consequences of the significant cuts to public higher education is UNH, um, as an example, they will end up taking more out-of-state students as a way to balance their budget, which I think is unfortunate because I think the public higher education system here should primarily be for New Hampshire kids. And if they start taking, in their entering class, a higher number and a higher percentage of out-of-state students, that also is not good for our state because the out-of-state students are then more likely to go back to their own states rather than stay in New Hampshire. That's a generalized statement. We're not everybody. But I, 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 why I focus so much on education? Um, if, we, if we have that education available, our students will stay here, and that will deal with the issue that Dennis Delay talks about. Yes? Governor, thank you so much for coming over here. Glad you're here today. I just have a question. Governor, European countries have made pension promises that are not sustainable, and having no ability to print the money, they're, coming, they're in the current crisis. But states in this country are also in a similar boat. It's estimated that total unfunded liabilities of the states are over $4 trillion. New Hampshire uh, pension system is estimated to be underfunded by $3.7 billion. We have made promises we can't keep. Wouldn't it be more rational a system to convert the divine, defined benefit pension plan into a defined contribution system as has happened to most in the private sector and to take away this huge sword hanging over the taxpayers of the state? 
Um, okay, so thank you for the question. Um, I think in terms of our own retirement system and pension fund, I think we're in relatively good shape. Um, a lot of changes were made to the retirement system even prior to this legislative session, such that it put us on a path to full solvency within 20 or 25 years over the long term, which is about the time period you should look at. You can't solve the problem in two years or three years or four years. And again, it goes back to decisions that were made in the early 80s that weren't very smart decisions. Well, intention, but weren't very smart. Back in the early 1980s, um, uh, the legislature created what is called a special account. And the plan was that every time the returns were above a certain threshold, the excess of those dollars would go into the special account that would fund cost of living increases and, med and provide medical subsidies. But nobody at the time said, what if the returns fell below, significantly below the thresholds? So consequently, the special account grew to hundreds of millions of dollars with all the attendant expectations that went along with that in terms of including cost of living increases. So, but, but the corpus didn't keep up with it. So one of the things that was done even prior to this legislative session is take a couple hundred million dollars out of the special account and put it back, put it back into the corpus. Um, as you know, there were changes made this last legislative session in terms of when people could retire, um, their expected contribution rates, and so forth. So I think right now in New Hampshire, we're on a path to where our retirement system and our pension account is okay. You know, whether it should be defined contribution or defined benefit, I think that's open to question. Um, I think that would require some analysis and some study. Um, but we are not like the European countries in terms of our pension system here in New Hampshire. I think we're on our way to where um, it will be sustainable going forward. Yes. Uh, the legislature will uh, reconvene in a, in a couple of weeks. Can you send oh. some? <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. We're right in the holiday season. <laughs> Can you say with some specifics what you look forward to most? <laughs> Ah, you know, I, I, I will, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, but I want to tell you that, you know, people sometimes say to me, um, you know, how are you able to cope with, you know, this new legislature and, you know, there are different initiatives and the fact that it's swung so far to the right. Um, I mean, one of the ways I've been, I've served as governor, and I've, I've done this going back to 2005, is the state house is really only a piece of my world. Um, it really is. I get out all the time. So, and I don't do that because what's going on in the state of Watterson is just the way I do my job. I did that when I was CEO of Noel. I'm out all the time. So, um, you get outside the state house, and it's still this great, big, wonderful New Hampshire that it's always been. And I'm very pleased about that. So I get out a lot, I get a positive reinforcement. So what goes on in the state house you know, it doesn't really get me down. So what, what am I looking forward to? What am I not looking forward to? I think that's the question. I think in terms of the not looking forward um, part of it, which may be an easier um, part of the question, um, I think we should continue to be focusing on jobs and the economy. That's what I believe we should be doing. Jobs, the economy, managing the budget, um, that should be our focus, and I'm concerned that that is not going to be the focus of the legislature. So, what does that mean? The part of this upcoming legislation that I'm not looking forward to, it's not, I mean, we'll deal with it, is the focus on guns, which is what we, I was at Plymouth State um, University yesterday, and, you know, they're worried about a couple people coming on campus today to protest Plymouth State's ban on guns on their campus. So they're coming on campus to protest. Well, that's going to be an issue. So there'll be, there'll be ongoing discussions about guns, making sure you all have guns. You don't need permits. You don't even need to conceal them. They can be loaded. Um, uh, focus on social issues, whether we're talking gay marriage, we're talking abortion, um, whatever the issue might be. So those issues that distract us from what I think should be our um, order of the day, um, which is jobs and the economy. 
So that's the stuff I'm not focused on. It, they turned out to be, they'll turn out to be discussions that are very divisive. They'll, they're very polarizing in their nature. Um, and they don't allow us to work together, which is what I said we need to do in order to accomplish things. Um, on the upside, um, I think is, as there is additional legislation focusing on how we can help get people back to work, we're going to talk, look at the research and development tax credits, see if we can increase that. That I think will help businesses which rely on research and development for their competitive advantage. Um, these are businesses that make products with a high value added component. They're less likely to be manufactured overseas. Ultimately, they'll, be, they'll create more jobs. Um, more focus on job training, which has been instrumental here in New Hampshire. And to the extent that we can continue to provide funds for job training, I think that's very important. Businesses continue to tell me about the importance of job training to them. In fact, we were able to lure a company to Rochester, and I know Rochester's not in Cheshire County, um, but, but a company called Albany International, um, we were able to lure them to Rochester. It's a $900 million company, 25 plants in 15 countries. It'll be 500 jobs initially, with the potential of over 1,000 if they bring their suppliers to Rochester. We're able to attract them because of job training grants. A $2 million job training grant that was included in the budget, by the way, um, in partnership with the community college system. So those are the things I'm looking forward to. Um, but all the emphasis on non-economic issues, I'm not looking forward to that. Because again, they tend to divide us. And a lot of those interests are driven by out-of-state interests, fueled by a lot of out-of-state money. You know, and I, I oftentimes wish they would just leave us alone to make our own decisions, make our own mistakes, and let us be the New Hampshire that we want us to be. Other questions, comments? Yes. Um, the Governor's Advisory Commission on Intermodal Transportation recently uh, sent its recommendations, I believe, to, to mm -hmm. you. Um, I was wondering about what your approach is going to be like in terms of looking at the transportation improvement plan. Um, we've done some analysis. I worked with the Regional Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. We've done some analysis where it seems as though our part of the state is getting a little shortchanged in terms of investment. And, uh, it's been a very important issue. I wonder if you could speak to how, how this is going to unfold. Yeah, um, they just passed it, as you know. It just happened, so I haven't had the chance to scrutinize it. And there are some variables um, that we need to worry about. One is how much money we're going to get from the federal government. The federal government, if they flat fund us, it's going to be $140 million. But they're talking about the plan is based on assuming a $40 million cut, which would then only be $100 million. So we need to just look at it very, very carefully. And as I said, I haven't had an opportunity to scrutinize it, which I will do. But I think you all here, in fact, Dale and I have talked regularly about some of these issues. I'm sure Kendall and I will talk about what the needs are that you have in Keene and in Cheshire County to make sure that you're getting your needs addressed, just like um, other parts of the state. Um, I also think, with regard to that question, is I'm a big proponent of, God bless you, I'm a big proponent of widening I-93, but at the same time, I-93 can't take all the dollars that are available, for example, in your communities, um, and uh, just focus that money on I-93, which is why I think we need to have a very uh, collaborative discussion about how we're going to fund the widening of I-93 and not have that the only project that goes on in New Hampshire. I also thought that we should continue, and you may agree with this or you may not agree with this, I also thought that we should have continued with the $30 surcharge um, that we had in automobile registrations. Um, by cutting that, you know, that cut $90 million that we could have used to partner with local communities, whether we're talking about roundabouts, whether we're talking about repairing roads and bridges, whether we're talking about um, one of the streets in Keene, um, or whether we're talking about money that's used for paving. I thought that was a mistake to do that. Um, but given where we are with the legislature, um, and given what I said, I think we have to be really fair to all communities and not let one or two projects take up all the money, I'll look at that very, very carefully. And I welcome your input, so you should feel free to give me a call. Um, if the, the, the recommendation comes to me, I look at it, make changes if that's what I 
um, think is necessary, and then I pass it on to the legislature, and ultimately the legislature has to has to pass that, as you know. Do you have any particular projects that you are you feel need to be funded that have been left out, or is it, do you all have time for dinner? <laughs> Where yep. we prioritize uh, projects, and you know, the two top projects, as an example, one is is being deferred until the end of the the last year of the plan, the out year of the plan, and then and that's J the Jaffrey Dogleg project. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second project is the Hinsdale Brattleboro Bridge, which has been on the ten year plan for years and years and years, um, and is currently on the deferral list. Mm -hmm. The cost of that project is about half the total 10-year budget that the state has for bridges. Um, it's not a redless bridge, but it's almost there, mm -hmm. and um, it's something that's been really important to the, to the region. Um, so again, I go. Other projects again yeah. that I'm sure Kendall will <laughs> talk about. He's already talked to me about them, um, and that's what I talked about earlier about the importance of maintaining our investment in the infrastructure. You know, um, when I was, uh, a number of years ago, I went over to look at the Spalding Turnpike, which runs from Rochester to Portsmouth, and looked under some of these bridges, the red listed bridges. And back in 1992, there were wooden pilings put in place meant to prolong the life of that bridge, or those bridges over there, for one year. And nothing had been done to the bridges going back to 1992. So it, were, it was a short-term decision to save money that ultimately, you know, you have to end up paying for. Otherwise, it's a real public safety issue. So I, I think, you know, we need to continue our investment in the infrastructure. I think it's important. Yes, Art. That, that was a, a great leading to my question, and, and I think we talked about this before, but with, with the advantage of having had four terms as governor, how, uh, what, what are your reflections on New Hampshire's ability to continue to raise revenue in the manner that it has been raising it, given the uh, given the difficulties we've had in healthcare, infrastructure, and education? Where's our future? Okay, um, and we have talked about this, um, and let me I'll, I'll address that very explicitly. Um, first of all, there are those who have said that the pot of gold. Um, at the end of the rainbow for New Hampshire is in expanded gambling. So let's just go to expanded gambling and we'll get $200 million a year and life will be perfect. You know, and as you may know, um, I recently said that I would veto any bill that came to me that would promote expanded gambling. Um, and, and I'm against it for, and I'll, I'll answer your questions. Um, specifically are, but I'm against it for a bunch of reasons. I'm against it because there's no regulatory system in place, and other governors tell me before you even consider it, make sure there's a regulatory oversight body in place, and there's not in New Hampshire. I am very concerned about proliferation, because that's what's happened in other states, and that if initially you put it in Salem or put it in Salem and Hudson, that at some point over the next 20 years, revenues would decline, costs are fixed for the most part, and people would say, you know, we already have them in Salem and Hudson. The Lakes region is suffering. Let's just put one up in the Lakes region. In fact, people in the Lakes region would like to see a big casino there. And then you say, okay, well, you know, revenues go down again. And they say, you know, Portsmouth is pretty important for tourism. Let's put it in Portsmouth. You know, people in Manchester say, you know, Manchester is the largest city. We need it right downtown Manchester. And then eventually, God forbid, somebody over here, or maybe it wouldn't happen to Keene. Um, but, but that's what's happened. Incrementally, over time, um, you know, we become a state that's full of casinos and slot machines, which I don't think would be good for New Hampshire. Um, and they want to put casinos and slot machines up in the North Country as well. Um, you know, maybe Berlin and Gorham, or maybe one over in Groveton and, and Colburn. Um, I know there are many of you who support a sales tax or an income tax. Um, I don't, and I, I, mean, I say that not for political reasons. I, I go back to what I opened up with. New Hampshire's doing so well, so well, compared to other states. Let's not mess up our strategy. Let's not do something structurally different that has the risk 
of affecting how well we're doing as a state from an economic perspective and a strategic perspective. That's why I think we have to be very cautious about going down any of those paths. Um, education. Um, I think we spend enough money on public education today. It's just not well spent. It's not efficient the way we're spending it. You know, I have had representatives come in to me and they'll come in and they'll, say, they'll bang their fist on the table and they'll say, Governor, we need to spend more money on public education. And I'll say, okay, how much do we spend today? And they'll look at me and they'll say, well, that's a stupid question, but we need to spend more money. And I'll say, okay, where does the money go today? And they'll say, well, that's another stupid question. We spent two and a half billion dollars on public education. Um, it's about $12,000 per student. That's all in. That's how much we spend. I think there's enough money in the system. I just don't think we're spending it the right way. We're not spending it as efficiently and as targeted as we should be doing. So I don't think the answer is to add 20% to our education budget. I think the answer is to spend it in a smarter way. And I feel aren't the same way about health care. We spend $10 billion on health care here in New Hampshire. We are one of the most expensive states in the country for health care. If all we did is to do the average, and I know some people don't like me to say this, if all we did is spend the average of what the top 10 states spend, uh, or the top 10 best performing states spend, we reduce our health care costs in New Hampshire by a billion dollars. So it's not um, necessarily bending the cost curve, it's reducing our cost on health care. So I feel the same way about health care. We have enough money in the system, we need to be smarter about the way we spend it. And that means getting away from fee-for-service, it means getting away from utilization. It's creating incentives that has people worried about costs and not sacrificing quality. Right now, very few players in the healthcare industry are worried about costs. Most employees don't worry about it because their you know, benefits are, are, are paid for. Um, uh, players in the industry aren't necessarily worried about it because costs are reimbursed. And I think our healthcare system here in New Hampshire, it may not be bankrupt, but you could argue it's close to being that way. So I think there's got to be a new paradigm. I don't think the answer is just spending more. We need to be smarter about how we spend it. Yes? Um, as a banker, we're always looking at the, the risk of higher interest rates having on our, our customers <coughs> the ability to meet their debt service in the future. What is the state doing to look at that risk of higher interest rates from here on the budget of Well, I mean, right now, the interest rates are incredibly favorable. You know, I mean, we borrow money. You know, I think our latest bond offering, it was like 2.8%. Um, you know, it's, that's pretty low. Um, I remember when my wife and I bought our first house, um, we had, we thought we got a great deal, a great deal. Our mortgage rate was 14.8%. Um, and, you know, that was down from the current rates back then, I think, of 16 or 18%. So the idea of, you know, mortgages at 4% now or 5% or 30 year mortgages is just, at least from my perspective, it's very, very low. And when I see us borrowing money at these rates, it's very, very low. Um, so it's not something in terms of low interest rates that, that I, I worry about because I think they're as low as they possibly could go. Um, will they go up at some point? Sure. Um, but most economists don't see that happening right now. Now you balance that with the weakness of the economy. You know, and I think most of us would like to see the economy become stronger, which may then drive up interest rates a little bit. Um, but it's not something that I worry about right now. I'm going to go back to Art's health care question. Um, I was at, I was at a uh, National Governors Association meeting, and there was a presentation put on by an economist and somebody from the Federal Reserve. And they were talking about where the growth in our economy was going to come from over the next 10 years. And, and both of them said, it's the health care industry. Healthcare industry is growing more rapidly than any other sector, faster than manufacturing. So I raised my hand, and C-SPAN was there covering all over I said, so he said healthcare costs are growing faster than any other sector. And they said, yes, 
So I asked them, I said, should we feel good about that or bad about that? And they looked at each other and they said, well, you answer the question. And I said, no, you answer the question. I mean, they couldn't answer the question. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think we should be worried if health care costs are going up as rapidly as they are. And we have to control those costs somehow without sacrificing quality and hopefully in a way that the hospitals and all the other healthcare organizations can be a collaborative participant in those discussions. Uh, and it, it has to happen. It has to happen in New Hampshire and it has to happen at the national level. Yes. Governor Lynch, uh, you may recognize me, um, Creeley Buchanan, um, and we are mutual friends. And we sure were. You're going to see a little of Creeley in what I'm about to say, I think. I'd like to call your attention to a little recognized program here in Keene, which generates excellent returns for the state of New Hampshire. It's a day that we have in October, and in that one weekend, that one day, we believe we generate almost a quarter of a million dollars in room and meals tax. It goes directly to the state of New Hampshire at that 9% rate. For 21 years, people in Keene have been making this program work, generating a quarter of a million dollars in room and meals tax for the state of New Hampshire every October. For a little over a year, one small company has been rallying to keep the program going. My name is Ruth Sterling. I grew up in New Hampshire, in Amherst, New Hampshire. And in New Hampshire, I learned that you don't whine, you don't tattletale, and you don't cry uncle. But I'm here today to do a little tattletaling. My state of New Hampshire has been making a quarter of a million dollars off of this program every year for 21 years and has yet to make any investment back in the program. And I would very much like to ask your help in finding a way to get the state of New Hampshire to help reinvest in Keynes Pumpkin Festival, which does so much for so many. And don't tell me the JPP program, because we don't qualify. So um, the other thing I would like to say is that uh, this effort has been done as a volunteer, grassroots, scrappy, um, non-whiny venture for 21 years. We're not going to start whining now, but we did get a bill from the state of New Hampshire this year for $10,000 for state troopers for that one weekend. And I'd like to ask you to very seriously consider making that your gift back to Keene. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Comments? Yes. Governor, I do think you're doing a wonderful job. 
I have a little concern with the House Bill, uh, actually 648, uh, eminent domain. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, I, and I, I give high kudos to public service in New Hampshire and our own utilities uh, in New Hampshire. I have a concern with other organizations, uh, private organizations coming in, taking property. Um, we're a live free or die state, and some of our freedoms are dying. And I, I get a little bit concerned about uh, private uh, enterprises coming in, calling the shots on eminent domain, where I think it should be out of the state house. Could you comment to that? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the Senate um, sort of tabled the eminent domain bill. You probably saw that. Um, just yesterday, and the bill itself keeps evolving, keeps changing. Public Service has now said they'll, they, they will, will not use eminent domain in order to get some of the routes they need for their so-called Northern Pass project. Um, I think we have to be very careful about use of eminent domain, you know, for a private purpose. Um, and so I think we have to be very, very careful before we expand, you know, any use of eminent domain. And that that bill continues to change, and it's going to change many times between now and if it ever does get out of the legislature, which, which it may not. It was introduced last year, as you know, and the Senate tabled it last year, so it didn't go anywhere. And it looks like that's where the, head, the Senate is headed this year as well. Yes. Okay, we'll take the last one. So hopefully it's going to end on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, um, there's a, a trend that um, uh, a lot of our state elected officials are questioning the use of federal dollars for running programs, including those uh, that you've identified as priorities, the economy, education, health care, um, and education. Um, in fact, House Bill 590 led to the formation of a study committee that would look into the acceptance of grants and aid uh, to run these types of programs. So I wonder, what is your thoughts about that, uh, uh, that trend, and, um, and where do you see it going? You know, we should ask our good friend, Senator Molly Kelly, where she thinks it's going. Um, I'm not sure where that bill is. I think at one point there was an initiative, and maybe this is part of the bill, um, that if the state takes federal dollars, you have to go back and look at the Federalist Papers that were drafted back in the 1700s to see if those federal dollars taken by the state are consistent with the intent of the drafters of the Federalist Papers. This is even pre-Constitution days. So I don't know if the drafters really thought about uh, some of the more progressive things we're doing in our state today. But I don't know where it's going to go. You know, I think it's nonsense to, I mean, there are some in the legislature who would like to eliminate federal dollars completely. There are some who would probably like to eliminate federal government or state government. Um, and uh, all the attendant benefits that it provides. So I, I don't know if it will, how far it will go. I just don't know. Um, but I'm not a proponent of that effort. Um, there are some interesting bills um, that we've had to deal with. There was a bill. Um, which I vetoed, that, um, that where the House almost overrode the veto. And I think this is a reflective of some of the challenges that we faced. And the bill, the bill was that parents could take their kids out of any course, any class, any grade, for whatever reason they wanted to. And the schools would have to figure out a way to to deal with that, to replace it with something else. So, if if little Dale didn't like his art class, you know, Dale's parents could take him out of art in second grade, and the teachers would have to figure it out. So you could basically describe and classify any instruction or any teacher or any part of instruction as objectionable, and pull your kid out of the class. Well, crazy. Absolutely nonsense. And what is even worse is the bill I vetoed, the House almost overrode the veto. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, these are some of the challenges. So I don't know what's going to happen to that bill um, in terms of having to go back and look at the, the uh, Federalist Papers. I think that's what they are, right, Molly? Um, 
I haven't read those papers in a while, I must tell you that. Um, <laughs> right, since high school. So that shows you a long time ago. Well, let me just conclude by, by saying again, um, I really love coming to Keene. I love coming to the Pumpkin Festival. I generally bring pumpkins every year when I come. Um, and I love coming over here to Cheshire County. So you all are doing a great job. Keep it up. And I will continue to be a, a willing partner and a supporter of what you do all here in the greater uh, Keene community. Thank you very much for inviting me.